ready to go into our teaching for tonight. I'm just pulling Periscope up because I always simultaneously broadcast on <clears throat> both Facebook Live and Periscope. All right, so I hope everybody's having a good evening. Let's uh, hey, hey there, Periscope. So let's start off with a word of prayer. God, and let me speak only what the Spirit of God would uh, share for the body with the body of Christ. And only what you want to be spoken, O oh God, let your will be done, not my will, but thine be done. That you might be glorified and the saints might be edified and unbelievers might be challenged, O oh God, to believe in you and turn to the God of heaven with all their hearts and all their souls. And I thank you for it and I believe you for it and I give you the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen and amen. All right. So, this is my No More Genie series. Now, the easiest way to find me online, to find anything I'm doing, is always to look up the hashtag PDT. Excuse me. Look up the hashtag PDT. And for the No More Genies, always look up the hashtag, hashtag NMG. Okay? So there's only one other uh, teaching. So, again, look up PDT and NMG so you can find that other teaching. You can find that on Periscope or my Facebook page, which is uh, Prophet David Taylor. Okay? So I'm not going to do that whole lesson over again, but I strongly, strongly encourage you to listen to it because I lay the foundation of what this, what this is about, but I'll just do a quick synopsis. And here's the synopsis. <clears throat> Unfortunately, what has happened, uh, it's happened down through the history of mankind, but it's definitely happened in my lifetime because I've seen it happen. And that is that the idea of what we call a genie concept has gotten in the minds of the saints. And they see God like he's a genie. Like all you have to do is rub the magic lamp. And then God will just wave his mighty hand and answer all your prayers and solve all your problems. The reason people love that so is because it puts it all on God. And it teaches people that it doesn't matter how you live. That's what people want in a very desperate way. So when people teach it, in the world, and when people teach it in the church, people just eat it up. They love it, okay? Because people want to believe that, number one, God is a genie. They want to believe, number two, that everything's up to him, okay? That it's all up to God. Well, you know, the Lord's will is going to be done. That is not true. How can you not look in the world around you and see that God's will is not automatically done, <laughs> Okay, if God's will was automatically done, we'd all be loving our neighbor as ourselves. And we know that ain't true. Okay, and then number three, number three, the big selling feature of genie concept, both among the saints and worldly people, is that it doesn't matter how you live. Okay, that's not true, but that's what people want to be true. They want to believe very desperately that it doesn't matter what I say. It doesn't matter what the meditations of my heart are. It doesn't matter what my choices are. Because God's just going to, all I have to do is say a prayer in Jesus' name, and God's just going to wave his hand and fix everything, and that's not true. Okay? That's genie concept in a nutshell. Now, again, very briefly, I'm just going to do a recap, because I'm not going to teach the whole number one lesson again. Amen. Salty said we must be holy. That's right. How did that get in the church? I'll tell you how, and I'll tell you when. It happened in the 90s. In the 90s, what happened was secular people started adapting the language of Christians. They started saying things like, aren't we blessed? We're so blessed. Look at all our blessings. Before that, secular people didn't really necessarily talk that way. But in the 90s, secular people started saying, oh, you know, I count my blessings and I thank God. But they were living worldly lifestyles. So they started to convey the idea that you can live any kind of way you want to, and God will bless you anyway. And many times they're talking about physical blessings, they're talking about uh, finances, or they're talking about career stuff, or they're talking about you know temporary family stuff. But if you don't have peace with that, then those so-called blessings are going to turn into a curse. 
And remember, God already told you in the word that it's possible, even read, hello, Anna, uh, hi, that it's possible to live your whole life and build up and accumulate so much wealth. And then God say to you, you don't know when you're going to die. So surprise, you're going to die tonight. <laughs> and all that stuff you spent your life building up, who's it going to belong to then? So it's possible to be financially prosperous in your career. But you still don't know when God is going to require your soul of you. And if you're not rich towards God, God says you're a fool. So we cannot limit our understanding of being blessed to just uh, finances or career or property or something physical alone. Because God said you can spend your whole life building that up and still end up a fool because you didn't invest with him. Okay, that's when it crept in. And also in the 90s, we started changing a lot of. I've been rejected. I don't want to go back. I understand that. Uh, sometimes people in church don't know what to do with this. Uh, and then also what we started doing was we started uh, changing a lot of the language and music in particular. And we stopped using God's name and we stopped using Jesus's name. And we started substituting words like love and personal pronouns like him and he. But the power is in the name of Jesus. You have to say his name. The power is in his name. His name, that's why the Lord said we could use it. Because Father gave Jesus a name that's above every name in heaven, earth, or hell. And at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. And you can only cast unclean spirits out in the name of Jesus. You can go up against demons if you want to <laughs> in your name. You can go up de against demons if you want to in whatever name you want to believe. They're not going to listen. They're not going to respond until you say Jesus' name. So this idea got in the mind of the saints that we could just talk about love and talk about him and he and the man upstairs because that's less threatening to worldly people and more accessible. But the power is in the name. That's why the Lord gave it to us. The name of Jesus, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the son of the true and the living God, the one that was sent from heaven, that was born of a virgin, that lived a victorious life, that was arrested, brutally beaten, crucified, buried for three days, and rose again on the third day, and snatched the keys of hell and death when he came back. That one, and now he sits on the right hand of God the Father, making intercession for us. That one, the name of Jesus Christ. You've got to use his name, okay? So that's when it started happening, where we started getting the idea that one, you can live any kind of way you want to, and God would still just bless you regardless. And two, that the name of the Lord didn't matter. Both of those things are wrong. <laughs> you, your, your choices do have an impact on your life. You do determine how things go, and we're, we're going to get into that tonight. Because our subject tonight is what is faith? What exactly is faith? And so, again, under the umbrella of genie concept, I wanted to be sure that we actually study what the scripture says and we throw out all of those wrong ideas. Because, again, very briefly, some people have allowed their children to die because of a wrong concept of faith. Demanding that God heal a certain way. And sometimes God is saying, take your medicine. Sometimes that's the healing. Sometimes God is saying, get up 30 minutes earlier and exercise. Sometimes that's the healing. Sometimes God is saying, change your diet. That's the healing. So we're going to get into that when I get into the subject matter tonight. But uh, that's why the name of this teaching, this umbrella is called NMG, No More Genies. Because you, you don't order God around. Okay? We follow him. He don't follow us. <laughs> okay? God does not bow down before us. We bow down before him. Okay? We follow the good shepherd. We hear his voice. We believe and obey. Not he's some kind of genie that you keep in a lamp and you live in any kind of way you want to. And then when you get in trouble, you bring out the lamp and just rub it. Or you say some magic words and all of a sudden he just comes and waves his hand. That's what people want so badly. Saints and sinners want that so badly. They want it so badly, they don't know what to do. That's why a lot of people, and another one, and when I talk about marriage and stuff, people always get really angry, but oh well. That's why a lot of people 
don't understand. A lot of people say that they're looking for a spouse, that they want to have a relationship. But they don't seem to understand that what you do <laughs> has a lot to do with who you attract. You think that God is going to send you somebody over and above how you behave and they're just going to look past everything and just be so in love with you <laughs> and just be so in love with you that they're just going to fall head over heels and all that and you don't have anything to do with it and that is not true. Because when you come into somebody's life on a romantic tip, you bring all your stuff with you. That's right. And when you let somebody in your life on a romantic tip, they bring everything they've got with them. So when you're talking about being married, you're asking somebody to deal with all that. Excuse me, if you're in perfect health or if you have health issues, if you have perfect credit, excuse me, or you have credit issues, if you have a good clean mind or if you have a dirty mind, if you have a good clean mouth or if you have a dirty mouth, if you have a really good family or if you've got bad relationships with your family, if you have a clear career path, like you know your purpose and you know where you're going and you have a plan or you're just kind of making it up as you go, that's what you're asking somebody to marry. Okay? So that whole idea that God is going to magically, just magically send this perfect person in your life and they're just going to look past everything that you bring with you is not true. That is not true. Okay? But we so desperately, and people in the world have doubled down. People in the world have doubled down and say things like, this is what I do, but it's not who I am. That is not true. You're the kind of person that does that, whatever it is you're talking about. Okay? Because people want it so badly, they, they don't want responsibility for their choices. They just want benefits. Okay? But for every benefit, there is a burden. For every pleasure, there is pain. For every privilege, there is price. For every right, there is responsibility. For every choice, there is consequence. That's actually how it works because that's the way God set it up. You understand? So that's why uh, it's been laid in my heart to labor here and help people get rid of genie concept and get into what the word actually says, but get some practical applications. Now, if you've ever wondered why I teach so practically, it's because when I was growing up, I heard people say things and it left me with more questions than answers. Like they would say, God's going to do this in your life. I'm like, great, how? When? And what's my part? What, what do I have to do? I just sit here and wait for God to do it. What do I have to do? And they would just say, and the Lord will make a way. How? How's God going to... But when I say how, I don't mean God's got to explain it to me. That's not what I mean. What I mean is, what is my portion in the mix? What am I supposed to do? You see what I mean? And so I heard a lot of that growing up, and it really frustrated me. So I made a promise to myself that if I ever went into ministry as an adult, I would be sure to give practical applications so you, know, so you have some action steps so you know what to do in your walk with God. Okay? So let's get in. So that was just a brief, uh, you know, preface. Uh, again, I strongly encourage you to go back and watch the first teaching, hashtag PDT, hashtag NMG, no more genies, to get the full uh, teaching. Okay? So tonight our subject is what exactly is faith? We're going to look at a lot of different scriptures. Okay? So get your Bible out or get your phone Bible out or get a browser out so you can look up uh, these scriptures online. Okay? Now, <clears throat> we're going to start with Hebrews 11.1. 1. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, and I'm reading out of Berean Study Bible. There are many different translations of the Bible. If you didn't know that, there's not just one. Hebrews 1.1 1, 1 says, Now faith is the assurance, in the King James it says substance. Now faith is the assurance of the substance of what we hope for and the cer <clears throat> certainty of what we do not see. The word there in English, faith, in Greek, that word is pistis, and it means faith, belief, trust, confidence, fidelity, or faithfulness. But I also want to look at that word assurance. That word assurance says an underlying confidence, assurance, a giving substance or reality, a guaranteeing a substance or reality. What does that mean? Practically, I'll, I'll tell you what that means. 
What that means is that <clears throat> when, when God gives a promise, that as soon as something comes out of God's mouth, it happens. It's like when God, uh, during the creation week, when God said, and let there be light, and there was light. And God said, let the firmament divide, and the firmament divided. And God said, let there be all kind of life, you know, wildlife mammals, and there were mammals. And God said, let the sea bring forth sea creatures, and there were sea creatures. See, whenever God says something, it happens as soon as he says it. But it's true in the invisible world. It's true in the spirit. And we want to get it out here. We want to get it out here in the physical, visible realm where we live. Okay? So uh, we have to uh, couple Hebrews 1.1 1, 1 with, he, excuse me, Hebrews 11.1 uh, 1 with Hebrews 11.3. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed by God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what is visible. Ah, by faith we understand that the universe was formed by God's command, so that what is, that, uh, what is seen was not made out of what is visible. What does that mean? Because that sounds kind of deep. What that means is that God made everything out of something invisible. He made it out of a substance called faith. Faith is a spiritual substance just like love is. Love is a real thing, but love is not a physical substance. You can't go to Target and get an eight-ounce bottle of love. Hope. Hope is a real thing, but hope is a spiritual substance. It's not you can't go to Walmart and get, you know, a gallon of hope. Faith, hope, love, they're spiritual substances that live in your spirit, live in your heart. So the Bible says that God formed everything by his command, and that which is seen was not made out of that which is visible. It's made out of a spiritual substance. And that substance is faith, okay? And so just like God took his faith and pulled something from the invisible to the visible, since we're made in his image, we have to take our faith and pull something from the invisible to the visible. What does that mean in a practical sense? It means if you have a dream of building a business, you have to believe that you can build that business and then you have to do like God and add some works to your faith because the Lord did something. He didn't just say, I sure wish I had some light. <laughs> I'm not laughing. That, <laughs> that's not what God did. Okay. God said, let there be light. And there was light. And then he shaped and molded the light. And then he turned it into the sun and turned it into the moon and turned it into the stars. He put some works behind his faith. Okay. So because we're made in his image, we have to do the same thing. So if you want to go back to school, if you if you can see that in, in your imagination, or you want to build a business, or you want to buy a property, you want to do whatever, you have to believe it, and then you got to put some works behind your faith to pull it from the invisible to the visible. Otherwise, it's just going to stay a dream. Okay? That's why so many people are just sitting on their lives and not living the lives they, they want because they don't understand that faith is a substance and it's a substance you have to use to pull <laughs> what you want from the invisible to the visible, just like the substance of love. When you are loving uh, your spouse or you are loving your parents or you are loving your children, what are you doing? You're taking a substance that's already in your heart and you're opening your heart and sharing it with them. And how do you share it? You share it by words. You share it by hugs, physical affection. You share, you know, the five love languages. You share it by acts of service. You share it by gifts. Look at that. All that love ain't going to do you no good unless you what? Unless you act on it. Right? Okay? Faith is the same way. It's not a genie concept where you just rub the magic lamp and shazam. No. You have to act on it the same way God did. You've got a, that thing that you want to happen. That's why I was talking earlier before about marriage. A lot of people say they want to get married, but I've discovered that a lot of people don't actually prepare themselves for marriage. So that means you have not put any works behind your faith. You don't really believe it. You're just sitting there as is, and you think that you as is is enough to attract someone to spend the rest of their lives with you, you've got to put some works behind your faith. You've got to put yourself in the marriage lane. 
Okay, and I've discovered that people that prepare themselves for marriage have an easier transition into being married because they put some works behind their faith. They acted on what they believed and they pulled it into their lives. And people that don't sometimes just grow by themselves and sometimes have miserable relationships because they never put any works behind their faith. They never took the substance and used it to shape and mold and create what they believe the way that God does because it's a substance, okay? And so since we're made in his image, we got to do it the way he does it, okay? And if you try to do it any other way, you're getting over in the genie concept, and you're going to be sorely disappointed, okay? What do I mean by that? You can't overeat and then say, in the name of Jesus, I cast out the fat. Woo! <laughs> I'm not laughing. You, you can't say, in the name of Jesus, <laughs> after you've overeaten, I cast out the calories. <laughs> no, 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 it doesn't work that way. That's genie concept. That's you saying, I can eat 4,000 calories a day and not exercise, and it's not going to have an impact on my body. That's not true. Okay? That's genie concept. That's why people love it so. Because we really want to believe we can just do whatever, whatever. We even write songs about it, whatever, whatever. We really believe we can just do whatever and then get this certain result. It doesn't work that way. It's not a magic kind of thing. Okay? Uh, money. Uh, money is another example. A lot of people pray and ask God for money. Do you know how God will answer you sometimes? God will answer you with ideas. <laughs> He will answer you with ideas, and I would dare say that some of you listening to me right now have had tens of millions of dollars of ideas run through your head. You just didn't take them seriously. You did not believe them. You did not take the substance of faith, the spiritual substance that lives inside of you, and mix it with those ideas and put some works behind that faith and get to building those ideas. You didn't do it. Okay? Sometimes you hear a song. And you say, wow, that's kind of nice. And then you just let it go. And six months later, somebody gives you some earbuds. You're on YouTube or you're watching your favorite TV show. And here comes a song. And you say, wait, now, wait. Now, I heard that song six months ago because God was trying to birth it into earth through you. And you didn't take it seriously. Do you see it? Can you see it? Okay. So you've got to mix uh, your faith. You've got to do like God does to pull it out of the invisible to the visible. Okay, it's not going to happen by magic. And if you're praying for money, many times God gives you ideas. And some of y'all look at me right now. Bill Gates started out Microsoft with an idea. Steve Jobs started out Apple with an idea. Bishop Jakes talks all the time about how when he first went to Texas, he said the potter's house was an idea. He walked in the building and he saw it. So what did Bishop, Bishop Jakes do? He added some works to his faith. He believed it and he built it. Okay, he pulled it from the invisible where it was living in his mind and his heart, and he pulled it out here where we can see it. And now it's a thriving megachurch. Okay, that's the way it works. Okay, so let me show you some people that failed and why they failed. Okay, that's in Hebrews 4 2. For we also received the good news just as they did. The they that they're talking about is the Jews under the old covenant. For we also received the good news just as they did, but the message they heard was of no value to them since they did not share the faith of those who comprehended it. Okay? Uh, let me read that to you in the King James because I like the King James. It says, uh, For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Okay? What does all that mean in a practical sense? Okay. What that is talking about, it's talking about when God brought the Hebrews to the edge of the promised land in uh, Numbers and Deuteronomy. And God was telling them, this is the land I want you to own. This is the land I want you to possess. You used to be slaves, but I took you out of slavery. I took you through the wilderness, and now I want to bring you into something. I want to bring you into being a land possessor. I want to bring you into being a land owner. I want to bring you into being a giant slayer, okay? You're, you're not slaves, and you're not, you're not anything like that. 
You're going to possess this land. You're going to own this land. You're going to conquer the giants. And you know what? They sent 12 spies to check out the land before they marched on it. Two spies came back, Joshua and Caleb, and said, we can do it. He said, they said, we're well able to overcome the challenges we have to overcome and take that land. And you know what the mother 10 spies said? They said, oh, we can't do it. They said, oh, there's giants in the land. They said, oh, we're grasshoppers. We're small. We nothing. We can't take it. Okay? And that made God so mad, he cursed them people to wander in the wilderness till they died. And every one of them people that said that, that didn't have any faith, they died, except Joshua and Caleb. They failed. Why did they fail? See, that's another thing that many times our religious backgrounds don't teach us. You can fail. Why did you fail? You failed because you did not believe God. That's why. You didn't believe. So they got to the edge of the promised land and wouldn't go in because they didn't believe God. And the Bible says clearly that they heard the word. They heard the Lord tell them, you can take it. You can do it. And the Bible says clearly it was of no value to them. Do you know what that looks like in a practical sense? That's them people that go to church for 20 years and never change. They didn't heard the word for 20 years and it hadn't done them any good. You know what I'm talking about? Them, them old mean saints. <laughs> I'm not laughing. Them people that have been in church for years and they mean. They've been in church for years and they're the same person they were 20 years ago. You know why? Because they've been hearing the word all the time and it hasn't done them no good. They don't believe it. Um, I have also seen another phenomenon, and that is people that think they need deliverance every week. They need a demon cast out every week or people that think they need a prophetic word every week. I found out what's up with people like that. You know what's up with people like that? They don't believe the words that God has already given them. One more time. They don't believe the words that God has already given them because the Bible says if you hear the Lord, uh, if you don't mix it with faith, if you don't believe what God is saying, it's not going to do you any good. That's why you fail. What does that look like in a practical sense? I'm finna get in your business now. I'm finna get deep now. What does that mean in a practical sense? There are lots of times when we're dating people, we're dating the wrong people. And God tells us to break up with them people and we don't. We don't believe him. And then what ends up happening? You end up like Samson. You end up in a world of trouble because you got involved with the wrong person. How many times has that happened to the saints? You know why? Because we don't believe. We don't believe that God has someone better for you if he tells you to break up with the person you're with now. Okay? Many times, like I said, um, if you're praying to God about money, God has given you ideas. He already gave you ideas, but you didn't believe them, okay? And so you didn't get busy trying to give birth to those ideas, and that's why you're still at the financial level you're at, because you didn't believe it, okay? So the Bible teaches us clearly that even if you hear the word, you can still fail if you don't believe it, okay? So, number one, faith is a substance. It's the substance that God used to make everything that we can see. He made it out of something invisible that you can't see, and he pulled what he wanted from the invisible to the visible. And that's what we have to do. Number one. Number two, you can fail. Because if you don't mix what God says with belief, if you don't believe it, you're not going to move forward and take the ground that God wants you to take. And I have discovered that, that there has been such a, a effort to tell people that, you know, God is a God of a million second chances. And he is. And the Lord's mercy endures forever. And it does. And from, you know, everlasting to everlasting, you know, his mercy endures. It does. And God will forgive if we confess our sins. God is faithful and just. That's true. But many times that message is not coupled with the fact that you can't just sit there where you are and stay where you are and think your life is going to change. Because once again, you're getting over in the genie concept. You think that because God has mercy and because God gives you a second chance and because God forgives you that you don't have to change. But you do. If you keep doing what you've been doing, you're going to keep getting what you've been getting. If you want to move forward and become a giant slayer 
and a land possessor, you're going to have to believe what God told you and then act on it. And if you don't, you will fail. I know some of y'all never heard, uh, you know, a minister say that in your life. I know you ain't never heard because they keep talking like it's all going to work out in the end. No, Lord, have mercy. There's too many examples of people in the Bible that fail. Adam failed. Adam was standing right there. He heard what the devil said. He knew what the devil said wasn't true, but his wife believed it. And Adam went and ate that fruit anyway and sent us all to hell with one bite of a piece of fruit. Samson. Samson didn't have no business being with Delilah, and he knew that. He told her the secret of his great strength, and then they cut his hair off, and then he lost all his strength, and then they blinded him and put his eyes out. He failed, and then he died early, listening to her instead of listening to God. Solomon. Solomon had all that wisdom and all that money, but Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines, and not one of them women turned his heart toward God. They turned his heart away from God, and Solomon ended up burning uh, incense to other gods when he was old, and God got so mad, he split the kingdom. Okay? Solomon waited till he got old to act a fool. He failed in his old age. Moses. God meant for Moses to go into the promised land, but Moses was so tired by the time he was 120 years old, fooling with them folks, Moses, Moses went out there and lost his temper and disrespected the Lord, and God said, okay, well, you're going to die early now because you don't disrespect me in front of the people. Okay, uh, Esau. Esau was the firstborn of Isaac because Jacob and Esau were twins, but Esau was the first one out of the womb, and Jacob came out of the womb with his hand on his brother's heel. Esau was the one in line to inherit Isaac's birthright, but Esau came back from hunting in the field one day, and Esau said, I sure am hungry, and Jacob said, well, I'll fix you a, a bowl of porridge, I'll fix you a bowl of soup, but in exchange for that, you've got to give me your birthright. And Esau, Esau said, sure, fine, whatever. And Esau sold his birthright for a bowl of soup. Later on, when he realized what he'd done, he cried some bitter tears. And he asked Isaac to bless him anyway. But Isaac was like, no, there's only one birthright. And I already gave it to Jacob. Esau failed. Okay? So don't tell me you can't fail in life. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Christians can fail. And the reason we fail is because we either didn't hear the Lord correctly or we didn't believe him. Okay? So, so I'm trying to be sure that there is balance to these messages. Because these messages make it sound like God is going to make your life turn out okay in spite of or regardless of what you do. And that is not true. And just because God gives you another chance and just because God has mercy... And just because God forgives you doesn't mean that you don't have to change your ways. Because if you've been doing something that's been producing a certain result, if you want a different result, you've got to do something different. Okay? As I was telling a friend of mine the other day, the Holy Ghost is not going to do for you the stuff that you can do. If you want some tomato plants, the Holy Ghost is not going to go back in your yard and till the ground and go to the, the seed store and get some tomato seeds and put the seeds in the ground for you. Holy Ghost is not going to do that. Okay? You can sit there all you want to. You can speak in tongues for 14 hours. And when you get through, the Holy Ghost is not going to put them tomato seeds in the ground for you. Okay? If you want some tomato plants, you're going to have to go out there and work that ground, get you some seeds, put the seeds in the ground. Uh, get you some fresh, black, rich soil so the seeds got somewhere to grow. Let the rain come. Let the sunshine come. Let time pass. Maybe put some fertilizer down and then that little sprout going to come up and the Lord will bless your crops. But the Lord is not going to plant them seeds for you. You got to do your portion. You got to do what you can do. So that's why, again, I'm trying to help you understand to get out of genie concept. And balance these messages that you're hearing about the part, about God's part, about the part that God is going to do with your part, <laughs> the part that we have to do. Okay? So, number one, faith is a substance, and God used it to build everything we see from what he didn't see. Number two, you can fail if you hear what God is telling you, you don't believe him. Okay? So, let's move on to point number three. Uh, point number three is, <clears throat> now, uh, this one is coming out of Matthew 17, 20. 
This verse says, uh, now, uh, let me give you a little context. In this passage of scripture, there were some people in town and uh, one of their kids was demon possessed. And they brought that child that had the unclean spirit to Peter and the disciples to get the unclean spirit cast out. And they couldn't cast him out. Then they brought that demon possessed child to Jesus and then Jesus cast the demon out. Peter asked Jesus, why couldn't we cast him out? And Matthew 7.20 is the Lord answering that question. Matthew 17.20 says, Because you have so little faith, he answered, For truly I tell you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Holy cow, there's a lot in that verse. Okay? Now, the, those words in English says, uh, because you have so little faith, in, in Greek is oligopistian, oligopistian, and it means of little faith. It also means that, when you, when you study that in Strong's Concordance, it means that Jesus was saying to Peter, you're not really listening and applying what I'm telling you. You have so little instances where you were actually listening to what I was saying, Peter, and you actually do what I was saying. Okay? So the Lord was saying that you couldn't cast that demon out because you haven't been listening and doing what I'm telling you to do. And that's many times the struggle. Now, this is not complete failure, but this is many times why we struggle. Okay? Because since faith is a substance, it has to be developed. You got to work it. You got to work it out the same way you work your body out. So if you want a six pack, if you want abs, you know you got to do some crunches or you got to do some you got to do some type of of things that will help your your stomach muscles get cut. They don't just get cut on their own, you know that. Well, I stopped by to tell you that in terms of exercising your faith, it actually works just like that. You actually have to be going out there and doing what the Lord said do on a regular basis for your faith to grow and for it to work. Then the Lord goes on to say, but truly, I tell you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Now, what does that mean? That means exactly what the Lord says, that if you believe what you say, you can have what you say. He says that in Mark eleven twenty three. 23, that if you believe it, if you believe it, how many times have you seen people start in what looked like impossible circumstances, and they kept saying, I'm a win, I'm a win, I'm a win, I'm a win. No, no, I'm a winner. I'm not a loser. I'm a winner. They kept saying it. They kept saying, I'm a winner. They said, yep, nope, I'm winning. And they were in these impossible circumstances, and it looked like there was no way they could win. And before it was all over, <laughs> before, it was all over before everything was said and done, what happened? They won. You know why? Because they kept saying it and they kept believing it and the mountains moved. That's what the Lord is talking about. Mm -hmm. If you don't believe that, I want you to listen to the language of winners. I want you to listen to people that win on a regular basis. I want you to notice how they talk. Do you know how they talk? They talk about winning. Mm -hmm. Just look at any interview after any game. In whatever your sport, if you like sports of any kind, Hockey, football, basketball, baseball, golf, whatever. They always run up and they want to interview the athletes right after the event. I want you to listen to the way the athletes talk. Listen to the way the winners talk, especially if they are regular winners. How do they talk? They talk about winning. Okay? There is your practical life example of what the Lord is saying. He's saying that if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, now what does that mean? I've heard so many people teach so many different things on that. What he means by that is it only takes a little bit. It only takes a little bit to have a big impact, but you got to keep saying it, okay? Because remember, a little seed turns into a big tree over time. Whenever you want a big tree, all big trees, no matter what kind of tree, oak trees, redwood, whatever, started off as little acorns, okay? But if you take a little seed and give it enough time, it'll blow up into this thing, that's what he's talking about. That You can start with just a little bit. But if you say it, you say it, 
Uh, that's what happened in our presidential election. I'm not going to get into politics, but I will say that when now President Trump was candidate Trump, and he was running against uh, candidate Hillary Clinton, everybody kept saying he can't win. He can't win. There's no way he can win. What was Donald Trump saying? He said, I can do it. He said, we can do it. We can make it. He's like, we can win. He's like, oh, no, it'll be terrific. It'll be great. It'll be wonderful. He kept saying it. And what happened? Every mountain moved, and he's president. There's another real-life example of what happens when you keep speaking to the mountain what you believe. Instead of speaking your circumstances, and instead of speaking your fear, that will bring you failure. If you keep speaking just what you see instead of what you believe, and if you keep speaking what you're afraid of, that's going to bring you failure. But if you start talking like a winner, and you start believing like a winner, and you start confessing winning, then you will see your faith, even if it starts very small, begin to move mountains. That's why the Lord was rebuking Peter, because he was telling Peter, you haven't been exercising your faith. You haven't been listening to what I've been trying to teach you, Peter, and applying it. That's why you couldn't cast a demon out. Do you get it? Okay, so number one, faith is a substance. We have to use it to build the same way God did. Number two, you can fail if you don't believe in this life. Number three, if you keep saying it and you keep believing it, you can move a mountain. Okay, now let's move on to point number four. And that is coming out of Romans 12 and 3. For by the grace given me, this is Apostle Paul talking, by the way. Apostle Paul wrote the majority of the New Testament. Okay? So this is Apostle Paul. Apostle Paul was not one of the 12 that walked with Jesus when he walked to earth as a human. Apostle Paul was called after the Lord was resurrected and ascended back to heaven. And the Lord appeared to him one day on the Damascus Road. Okay, that's how Saul of Tarsus became Apostle Paul. That's who's speaking here. Okay, so yes, there are more than 12 apostles. Okay, there's the 12 that walked with Jesus, but they weren't the only apostles. Okay, so Apostle Paul says, For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but think of yourself with sober judgment according to the measure of faith God has given you. Oh, now let me read that out of the King James. Let me find that. Okay. For I say, this is the King James Version. For, for I say through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought, but to think soberly according as God had dealt to every man the measure, the measure of faith. Let's look at that word in the Greek. In the Greek, that word measure is metron. It means a measure, whether lineal or cubic, a measuring rod. It means a certain amount, according to the measure of faith God is giving you. Now, why is that significant? That's significant, number one, because don't say that you don't have any faith, because the Bible says God has given to every man the measure of faith. So you at least have a measure of it. Think of it like if you're making cornbread, and you want to pour in some meal, and you want to pour in some flour, and you put in a little bit of baking soda, and you mix in some egg, what are you doing? You're measuring, and you're putting the ingredients in. Well, God puts in the, here, in the human spirit a measure of faith, something to get us started. Everybody has enough faith to believe in God and get saved. Okay, Every human, you have that. Now, whether or not you use it or not depends on whether or not you're born again or not. Because just because you can believe doesn't mean you've chosen to do so. But you've got a measure of faith that God has given to you. So the point I'm trying to make there is I want you to be encouraged and not discouraged. Sometimes, especially if you're just starting out as a Christian, you can look at other people that are further down the road in their faith. And you say, oh, well, I could never be like that. Or, man, they have so much faith. Or, man, they know so much about God. Or, they know the Bible forwards and backwards. And I could never be that way. That's not true. God has given you a measure as well. He's given us all a measure. But that's where we start. OK, and so when when God gives you that measure, you start. And Paul here is talking about taking a good, honest assessment of yourself. Now, if that doesn't destroy a genie concept, I don't know what does. Paul says here that do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, 
Because you ought to think highly of yourself. You ought to have good self-esteem. But you shouldn't think more highly. You shouldn't think that you're more than you are. Then he says, but think of yourself with sober judgment. Now, what does that say? That says, take a good, honest look at yourself according to the measure of faith God has given you. In other words, to put it in our vernacular, keep it 100 with yourself. Okay? 40 ain't the new 20. 20 is 20 and 40 is 40. Okay? Either you graduated high school or you didn't. Either you have a bachelor's degree or you don't. Either you have a master's or you don't. Keep it real. You know how we say that all the time? But but there's this tendency, <laughs> there's this tendency in American culture to, to keep it so fake <laughs> until we begin to lose touch with our actual reality. And if you want to start a family, starting a family at 52 is different from starting a family at 22. Well, can't anybody tell me I can't do it? Okay, did anybody say you can't do it? It's not a matter of whether you can or you can't. 22 ain't 52. The Bible says you got to think of yourself with sober judgment. Okay? Let me give you another practical example. Because remember, our purpose here is to destroy genie concept. Uh, if you want to participate in the Olympics, depending on your sport, okay, because the Olympics are intense, man. Depending on your sport. Now, volleyball is, you know, something you play the game for a while. If you do kayaking for a while. But a lot of Olympic sports are about five minutes out of your life. Think about that. You got to train for 10, 12, sometimes 15 years for about five minutes out of your life. Woo. Olympics ain't no joke. But if you want to be in the Olympics, you have a window. <laughs> you have a window. Okay, to participate in the Olympic Games. And then at some point, you're going to age out. At some point, you're going to hit a point where your body can't do what, need, what it needs to do to compete at that level. It doesn't mean you can't compete because there are actually Olympic Games for every age group. There are Olympics for, uh, for the elderly, like people in their 80s and 90s, seriously. But the main games that we see on TV, you've got a window in your life if you want to compete during those games. So you probably don't want to wake up at, you know, 67 years of age and say, I wish I had been in the Olympics, unless there's a sport you can still play at 67. Like, you can still golf, you can still bowl, probably won't be doing the high jump at 67. And that's not talking about people. That's thinking of yourself with sober judgment. That's what the Bible says. Why is that so important? Because some sometimes in church, <laughs> we hear we hear these these big speeches about what God can do, and God can do anything. God gave Abram and Sarai; He changed their names to Abraham and Sarah, the power to have a baby at an advanced age. Okay, but if the Lord hasn't given you a promise of having a baby at an advanced age, I would suggest you do not wait. <laughs> until you are super, super old and then try to have a child. If God told you he was going to do it, then it's going to happen because the Lord said it. But if the Lord didn't say it, better to go ahead on and try to have your kids when you're young, when it's easy to get pregnant and you got the energy to run around out there with them and all that. That's sober judgment. That's what I mean. Because sometimes we hear these messages, we hear these faith messages, and there's nothing wrong with believing big, there's nothing wrong with dreaming big, but sometimes we're not looking at ourselves with sober judgment. Okay? You are probably not going to start a gymnastics career at 30. You have to start your gymnastics career as a child because you've only got so long for your body to be that flexible to do the things you need to do. Now, I know there was, I think she's either Romanian or Russian. There's a woman there still competing who I think is like in her 40s. So I know there's exceptions to the rule. She was in these last games. I can't call her name. She's either, she's either Romanian or a Russian. And she's like 42. So I'm not saying it can't be done. But you must admit, the vast majority of gymnasts are not in their 40s. The vast majority of gymnasts are uh, in their early teens. So I'm saying, all I'm saying is, when you hear these faith messages... You got to mix in what the scripture is saying about sober judgment. Because being a parent from 20 to 40 
ain't the same as being a parent from 40 to 60. Ain't nothing wrong with having kids later in life if that's what you want. But it ain't the same. Okay? And that's why you need to have sober judgment. You need to look at yourself. Now, that's the scripture saying that. That's not me saying that. So that's what I mean when I say we need to balance these messages when, we, when we're hearing all what God can do. We need to balance what we're hearing and think of ourselves with sober judgment, okay, according to the measure of faith God has given us, okay? So number one, quick review, faith is a substance. Number two, you can fail if you hear God and you don't believe him. Number three, you got to exercise it, even if it starts small. You got to get out there and do what the Lord is telling you to do. You got to exercise it. And number four, that God has given you a measure, so don't be discouraged. But also, according to that measure, keep it real with yourself. Keep, you know, keep it 100. Okay? If you want to have more children, that's a different conversation for males and females. Okay? The, the reproductive cycle of a woman is not the same as a reproductive cycle as a man. That is not misogyny. That is not hatred. Those are biological facts. Some men want to father children for as long as they can. If that's the case, then they're going to have to do that with women that can still have the children. That is not a put down. That is not misogyny. That is not hatred. That is reality. Okay? Because you've got to think, the Bible says, think of yourself with sober judgment. Am I at an age and a stage to bring more children in the world? Because when we're young, that answer is always yes. Because your body's on fire with hormones and, okay? But as time goes on, you have to take an assessment, okay? So that's just a practical example of what I mean, okay? All right, we're getting ready to wrap up here. Man, that hour went fast. <laughs> we're getting ready to wrap up here. Again, I want to review those principles one more time. Number one, faith is a substance. God used that invisible substance to pull what he wanted from the invisible to the visible, okay? And that means that's the same thing we have to do because we're made in his image. It's not magic. If God did it that way, we have to do it that way. Number two, you can fail. You can get right to the edge of the promise and fail to go in because you didn't believe God. You kept, you kept on confessing low self-esteem. You kept on not believing it could happen and you're not going to go in. You can fail, okay? Number three, you got to exercise it, even if it's a little bit. Faith the size of a mustard seed. You got to keep speaking to the mountain. Because if you keep speaking to the mountain, eventually that mountain's going to move because the Lord said it would. But you have to exercise it. Okay? And number four, you've got a measure of faith. So don't be discouraged. If you see people further along in their faith journey than you, don't be discouraged and feel like I can't ever get there because that's not true. But also, you got to keep it real with yourself. Think of yourself with sober judgment. Take a good, honest look at yourself and where you are in life and keep it real with yourself and apply your faith accordingly. Does all that make sense? Okay, good. God bless you. Uh, I'm so happy to, to share this teaching on faith. I'm so excited. I'm so excited about this No More Genie series because I want to help the saints get the proper balance in their lives. That the proper balance is we're going to let God do his part and we're going to do our part. It actually takes both. And if you ever get confused about that, then always remember tomatoes in the backyard. Okay? Always remember, if you ever get confused, always remember tomatoes in the backyard. If you, amen, God bless you. Uh, I'm glad it was a blessing. If you want tomatoes in your backyard, you have to go out there Break up the old dirt, pull out the weeds, pull out the rocks and the stones, get some, some black soil that's rich and fertile, get you some seeds from the seed store, plant the seeds and space them, cover the dirt up, let the rain come, let the sunshine come, let some time pass, maybe put some fertilizer down, and then you get a little sprout. And the Lord will bless your harvest. The Lord will let the rain come and the Lord will let the sun come. The Lord will bless your efforts. But you, the Holy Ghost is not going to plant him seeds for you. That's how it works. So we're going to let God do the God part, and then we're going to do our part. No more genies. 
If God tells you to take your medicine, take your medicine. <laughs> okay? If God tells you to exercise, exercise. If God tells you to change your diet, change your diet. If God tells you that the person you're dating is not the person he has for you, break up with him. That's going to be really hard. But that means there's the right person down the road and God wants you to be free so that when the right person, right person comes, you can get with them. Because if you stay with the wrong person, you're going to miss the right one. Okay? So we're going to let God do his part. We're going to let God do the God stuff. And we're going to do our part. Okay? All right. So if there are any prayer requests, put them on the screen right now. And let me pray for you. If you've got anything you want prayer for, put them on the screen. I'll pray for them. If not, we'll close out with a closing prayer. Now, I am on Periscope and Facebook Live every Sunday at 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. That's where I do my live prophetic word. So whatever word the Holy Ghost has for the body of Christ, uh, that happens on Sunday, 2.30 p.m. I'm normally done between 2.45 and 3. So that's like 15 minutes to 30 minutes. Every Sunday, 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. This teaching is called No More Genies. This only comes on once a month. Okay? Comes on once a month on the second Thursday at 7 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time. So today is the second Thursday of June. That's why I'm here. And I won't be back. Let me pull up July's calendar. The second Thursday of July is... Hold on. Second Thursday of July is July 12th. Oh, it's my sister's birthday. So, second Thursday of July is July 12th. So, that's the next time I'll be on with this No More Genie teaching. Okay? All right. So, I don't see any prayer requests. So, I'm going to close out with a word of prayer. Thank you, God, for your word. Thank you, God, for showing us what faith really is according to the scriptures. Thank you, O oh God, for the power of your Holy Spirit that opens our eyes to your word because we can't understand your word without the Holy Ghost and we can't understand you without the Spirit of God. So we thank you for revelation. We thank you for showing us how faith works. And now, God, we want to go forth and work it. We want to go forth and practice what we've learned. We want to go forth believing and applying what you've taught us tonight, oh God, uh, that we can give birth to the things you want us to give birth to and so that we can take the promised land because we are not grasshoppers. And we are not defeated, but we are giant slayers. We are giant killers. We are landowners and we are land possessors in you. And I thank you for it and I believe you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Well, again, amen. God bless you. That blessed my soul. And I hope that was a blessing to you. Um, also, if you want to make uh, donations to my ministry, that is uh, paypal.me. I put that paypal.me link uh, underneath the, uh, the video. Uh, I have a project I've been working on for a while where I want to work on feeding some homeless and giving them a prophetic word. So when you give donations, uh, I do have a not-for-profit, so your donations are tax deductible. But I also want to set up a ministry where I can bring some food to the homeless. And I, and I really want to bring them a prophetic word because nobody grows up to be homeless. Nobody plans that. And somewhere along the way, we took some wrong turns. So I want to give the Holy Ghost a chance to use my mouth and use my gifts. So... If you want to bless my ministry with a donation, I'll put a PayPal.me link up. And again, that is tax deductible because I am a, a 501c3 not-for-profit. Okay? Thank you so much. Oh, and I have some more stuff to tell you. I have to tell you next time, but it's got to do with my music. So I've got some more goodies for you. So I've got more ministry coming. So thank you so much. God bless you. I appreciate your support. I'll see you this Sunday at 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time for the live prophetic word. And I'll see you for the next installment of No More Genies on Thursday night, July 12th, 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. Have a great week, rest of your week. God bless.